14, 1950, two-year-old Jackie Copeland was playing with his three older sisters at a picnic in Pleasantville, Pennsylvania. This picnic was for Jackie's father's company, so there was lots of parents and lots of other kids there, and it was located on this hillside that was right up against a very swampy forest. Jackie's parents have been keeping an eye on Jackie and his three sisters while simultaneously trying to have conversations with some of the adults. And at one point, they got so sucked into a particular conversation that for a little while, they were not looking at their kids. And when they finally stopped talking to this person and turned to look, Jackie was gone. In a panic, the parents rush over to the daughters and they ask them, you know, where's your brother? Where's Jackie? And they say, oh, we don't know. And the parents turn around and it's just a sea of people and other kids and it's just chaos. And so Jackie's father just yells to the group, I can't find my son, help me find my son. And so very quickly, the whole picnic starts looking for Jackie Copeland. After about 15 minutes, when over 100 people looking could not find any trace of Jackie, his parents called the state police. The police showed up in force with bloodhounds and they began looking all around the area, but the dogs couldn't pick up a scent and they, like the rest of the hundreds of volunteers, could not find any indication of where Jackie might have gone. The assumption was he must have wandered off into the forest, but after being in the forest and looking around and seeing how difficult it was to navigate because it was basically just this big swamp, they figured we're bound to run into him here because he just can't have gotten very far. But that night when the sun went down, they still hadn't found Jackie and they still had no leads. And so the police and most of the volunteers had to suspend the search until the next day when there was daylight. And so Jackie's parents and some really hardcore supporters, they stayed out all night just yelling for Jackie and continuing to look, even though it was nearly impossible with no light. The following morning when the search was picked up again, there was a crew of people that were way outside the boundaries of what was considered the main search area. They were two miles into the swampy forest at this oil repressuring plant. The plant itself was situated on this one stretch of dry land in the middle of this forest, where basically all around it was this impassable, almost moat-like swamp where the water was particularly deep right around the edges. The searchers were not on plant property. They were on the other side of that deep swamp water, just looking at the plant. And one of the searchers happened to notice a child was poking their head around the back of a tree that was right next to the plant. It was like the child was peering at the searchers before tucking itself back behind the tree. The searchers couldn't believe it and they rushed over to the plant and sure enough, it was Jackie Copeland. Jackie was sent to a hospital and a doctor examined him and said he just had a couple of scratches on him. But other than that, he was in great health. A local newspaper called the Logansport Press followed up with the Copeland family after they were reunited with their son. And they wanted to know what everybody else wanted to know. How did your son get through two miles of impassable swampland onto this plant that even adults have difficulty getting to? In the article, the parents said after they got their son back from the hospital and they got him home and, you know, fed and cleaned up, they asked him, you know, what happened? How did you get where you got? And they would say, although he's two years old and he spoke in, you know, child speak, kind of like child gibberish, his story was very consistent every time they asked him and they asked him repeatedly. And so his story was they were at the picnic and he was looking into the forest and he saw someone peering from behind a tree at him. And Jackie felt like this person or this creature wanted him to come into the forest. And so he got up and he walked to the forest. And as he got closer to this creature or person behind the tree, they scampered farther into the forest. And so Jackie pursued them. And so as Jackie continued to walk towards this person or creature who kept vanishing farther and farther into the woods, he said he reached an area that he called the awful dark. And when he was in the awful dark, he said there were all these wild animals around him that he couldn't see that were howling and barking at him, but they wouldn't get closer to him because he was with a giant. And this giant led him through the forest and led him to this plant. While it's easy to discount this story because it's being told by a two-year-old who does not understand everything they just went through, what's not easy to discount is how Jackie wound up two miles away on this plant, which meant he would have crossed a two mile stretch of impassable swamp. That's what the police were saying. That's what the searchers were saying. It's not possible for a two year old to cover this distance. So the only rational explanation is Jackie had help getting to this plant. And it's also interesting to consider the fact that when Jackie was found by the searcher at the plant, he described Jackie as peering from behind a tree, like he was kind of hiding from the searcher. 
It's the same behavior that Jackie described this person or creature doing to him when he was at the picnic. And so between Jackie's story staying fairly consistent for a two-year-old and him mimicking the behavior of that person or creature he saw in the tree line, it's led people to speculate that while Jackie certainly may not understand who or what was calling him into the woods, that there's a real possibility that there really was someone or something that was watching Jackie from the tree line and got him to come into the forest. On February 7th, 1970, 16-year-old Jeff Haig was hiking along the Appalachian Trail with his Boy Scout troop. Jeff had been a Boy Scout for three years and he had been on similar hikes in the past and so he was very comfortable with hiking, with camping, and being outdoors. The hike they had planned was only about two miles long and it was a beginner trail that was very well marked and it was broad daylight so it was a very easy hike to make. About three quarters of the way through their hike the Scoutmaster had the group stop and sit down and take a break and Jeff wound up being the last one to kind of make it into this rest stop. He had kind of fallen behind the group, he looked tired and ragged and the scoutmaster asked him, you know, are you okay? Do you need food? Do you need water? And Jeff would say, he's just fine. He's just a little bit tired. And so after a few minutes, when the group was getting ready to stand back up again and start hiking again, one of the senior scouts was not done eating. And so they asked the scoutmaster if they could be the last to leave the site and meet up with them farther down the trail. Scoutmaster said that was fine. You know, we're, we're pretty close to the end of the hike anyways. And so we'll see you in a few minutes. And so Jeff, the scoutmaster, the rest of the troop, they all get up, they start hiking down the trail while this one senior scout stays back to finish eating. After only a few minutes of walking down the trail, Jeff once again began falling to the back of the line until he finally stopped and he called out to the scoutmaster and said, you know, he's not feeling great. He's gonna sit down in the middle of the trail and wait for the senior scout who he knew was still eating at the rest stop. He said he was gonna wait for him to catch up with him and then he and the senior scout would walk together the rest of the way. Now, at this point, the scout master's thinking they're only about, you know, five, 10 minutes from the end of the hike. And so he didn't want him to sit there, but he figured, okay, he's tired. The senior scout's gonna be coming through this really well-marked trail any minute. so not a big deal. And he told Jeff, no big deal, we'll see at the end. And so the scoutmaster, along with the other scouts, makes their way to the end of the trail, which comes to an end in a parking lot. They turn around and they just wait for Jeff and the senior scout to come out of the trail. A couple of minutes later, the senior scout emerges, but there's no Jeff. And so the scoutmaster goes over to him and he says, you know, where's Jeff? And the senior scout is like, what? I didn't see Jeff. I, I was alone and then I walked down the trail and I, I didn't see anyone. And so the scoutmaster's like, Jeff was sitting in the middle of the trail, like maybe a couple hundred meters away from you. He was waiting for you. And the senior scout says, no, I, I didn't see him. And so in a panic, the scoutmaster and the rest of the scouts ran back up the trail because it wasn't that far to get back to that rest stop. And they're looking for signs of Jeff the whole way and there's none. At the rest stop, they turned around and were yelling for Jeff the whole way back down to the parking lot. And again, they didn't see him. So they hopped in the van they had left in this parking lot and they drove to the park headquarters where they informed park services that they're missing one of their scouts. The park service immediately sent teams out to the area where Jeff had gotten lost and they called the police who sent out a whole nother crew of people to assist in the search. Considering how well marked the trail was, everybody was baffled that Jeff could get lost so quickly and so completely. Luckily, Jeff had a pack on that contained warm clothes, a sleeping bag, food, water, and matches. And so they're looking around and there's snow on the ground and it's already starting to snow some more. And they're thinking, you know, he does have basic survival skills and he's got some supplies. He should be able to survive on his own out here for a couple of days if we can't find him. Over the following week, despite hundreds of people out looking for Jeff in this area, they couldn't find him. And making matters worse is the temperature was plummeting every single day to the point where every night was well below freezing. On the 16th, almost exactly a week from when Jeff went missing, they made a big discovery. They found his pack sitting on a rock in the middle of this icy river where the only way it could have been placed on this rock is if he was standing in the water, which would have been at least waist deep. And even more strangely is all the contents of the bag had been pulled out and placed neatly on the rock as if someone was taking careful inventory of what was inside. And it didn't look like anything was missing. Although at the time there was no good theory as to why the pack was where it was and why it looked the way it did, what basically everyone could agree to at this point is now that Jeff does not have his supplies, 
he's almost certainly dead or going to die soon. And sure enough, two days later, Jeff's body was found approximately a thousand meters upstream of where the pack had been found in the river. Jeff was found sitting up against a tree, his jacket was unzipped, his pants were unzipped and pulled down slightly, he did not have a hat on, he didn't have gloves on, he had removed his socks but put one of his boots back on. His body didn't have any scratches on it and he didn't have any broken bones, it was determined he died from exposure. So with Jeff's discovery, there were naturally a lot of questions. The first one being, why did Jeff wade into an icy river and place his pack on a rock and then take everything out and lay it out on this rock only to then abandon his pack and walk 1000 meters upstream and sit down at a tree and start taking his clothes off. And even if he had a good reason to leave his pack and go upstream to that tree, he would have known that if he doesn't go back down to get the contents from in that pack, he was going to die. His legs weren't broken, he could walk, but he didn't. He sat at the tree until he died. And regardless of the pack mystery, why did he leave the trail in the first place? The last thing he said to his scoutmaster was he was going to sit on the trail and wait for the senior scout to finish eating and come meet him. He was not indicating that he was going to go anywhere. He was actually saying, I'm going to be right here. So there's nothing about his behavior that indicated he wanted to voluntarily leave the trail. Yet, based on what they saw, it looked like as soon as his scoutmaster turned around and walked down the trail, Jeff must have hopped up and ran off the trail and jumped into the river and taken his pack off and ran up to the tree and taken some clothes off and sat down and slowly died. Now, of course, none of this makes any sense, unless you consider an alternative theory put forth by people involved in the search, and that was Jeff was abducted. In that moment of time when he was sitting on the trail and his scoutmaster had walked away and the senior scout had not finished eating yet, so had not seen Jeff yet, while he's sitting there by himself, somebody was in the tree line watching Jeff, saw this moment of weakness and rushed up and took him. That theory does explain a lot of the strangeness around the scene where Jeff was found, but it requires someone to abduct Jeff for no clear reason. They weren't even interested in Jeff. They brought him down to the tree and then were just kind of curious about him. They didn't physically harm him. They kept him from going anywhere, and that ultimately harmed him, but there were no marks on him. He was not attacked. And then after he passed, or shortly before, they just took his pack and were rifling through it and putting it on the rock and looking at each piece inside the pack, but they didn't take anything. They left it where it was, and then they vanished. But what kind of a person is just hanging out along the Appalachian Trail, randomly abducting people and toying with them as if they're a child toying with an ant? In 2006, 38-year-old Corey Kelly contacted his good friend Jim Naprud to see if he wanted to go grouse hunting with him. Grouse are a type of game bird. Jim agreed, and the pair decided to meet at the Red Lake State Wildlife Management Area in Fortown, Minnesota, which was not far from where either of them lived. So the two men, along with Jim's dog named Sammy, arrive at the campsite on October 16th. They get out, they start setting up the campsite, putting the tent up, getting all the food laid out, and that's when Jim realizes they did not bring gasoline. So he says to Corey, he's gonna go into town and get some gasoline. Corey said he would stay back and continue setting up the campsite, maybe go out and get some firewood, and he would look after Sammy while Jim was gone. When Jim pulled away from the campsite, he turned and saw Corey carrying a shotgun with Sammy by his side walking into the woods. And so Jim assumed he must be heading into the woods to go grouse hunting. An hour and a half later, when Jim came back to the campsite, Corey and Sammy were gone. Now at first, Jim wasn't concerned at all. He figured Corey was still out grouse hunting and that he and Sammy would be back any minute. And so Jim hops out of his truck and he continues setting up camp. He goes out and gets some firewood. The whole time he's kind of looking around the woods, waiting for Corey and Sammy to you know, make a sound or show themselves and they don't. And as the sun goes down, Jim's starting to feel a little bit more worried. And so he gets his phone out and he tries calling Corey, but the cell phone reception's so bad, he can't place a call. Jim knew Corey was extremely competent in the outdoors. He was an avid hunter and he knew this area really, really well. However, he thought it is possible he could have gotten turned around while he was out grouse hunting, and so I should signal where the campsite is. And so for several hours, Jim honked his horn and flashed his truck's lights in hopes that Corey would see or hear him. Finally, after midnight, when Corey and Sammy had not returned, Jim decided, you know what, I'm psyching myself out. I'm sure they're fine. They'll be back in the morning. I don't know what happened, but I trust Corey can handle himself. So Jim falls asleep and very early the next morning when he gets up, he's looking around, hoping he's gonna see Corey and Sammy. 
They're still not there. And so Jim begins to search the area himself. Jim walks two miles into this forest that's very thick. It's very swampy. He sees no sign of Corey or Sammy and he's yelling for them. He's trying to call Corey on his phone, but there's no reception. And so he turned around and walked back to the campsite, now trying to dial 911, but even that wasn't going through. It was a total dead zone. And then luckily he saw some campers that were out near his campsite and he asked them to try calling 911 and their call did go through. The police show up and they begin searching this forest and they find almost right away that it's so difficult to walk in this forest because of how swampy and marshy it is that they have ATVs brought in just so they can do a basic search of the forest. And for two straight weeks, they looked everywhere in this forest for Corey and Sammy and there was nothing, no sign of them. Then on October 25th, nine miles away from where Jim and Corey's campsite was, two hunters found Sammy wandering around the forest and she was hungry and dehydrated, but overall she was in good health. And so they tried to get her to track to wherever Corey was, but she wasn't doing it. At this point, the focus of the search was shifted to where Sammy was found, and they began searching that area, and three days later, they found Corey's cigarettes and his lighter. The following day, they found Corey's overalls, socks, and sweatshirts, now 14 miles from where Jim and Corey's campsite was. But even after finding all these things that belonged to Corey in a relatively small area, they looked and they couldn't find Corey. And then the weather started to get really bad and it started to snow in the area and they had to postpone the search. The search was started up again in mid-November and they brought out all these scent sniffing dogs and they searched that area near where all his things were found for 13 more days, but again, they couldn't find anything. And then another wave of bad weather came in and they had to postpone the search again, this time for the whole winter. They began looking for Corey for a third time the following year on April 28th by flying a plane over the area where all of his clothes had been found and they were able to spot Corey's body. He was laying right in the middle of the swamp, right in the middle of the tall grass. It was determined he died of hypothermia on the first night he went missing which means he had to have run a mind-boggling 14 miles through this forest before winding up in the swamp. And if you remember on the very first search for him, the police were unable to just walk around the forest because of how swampy and wet it was. They had to bring in ATVs just to look around. And so the idea that Corey was able to run 14 miles in this swampy forest seemed impossible. In fact, that's what searchers said, it was impossible unless you were being pursued. If you think your life is in danger, you will do things that you cannot do unless your life is in danger. Adrenaline makes it that way. Lending credit to the idea he might have been pursued by someone or something is where he was found. He was found in the middle of the swamp, in the tall grass. There was a hard packed path about 15 feet away from where he was found that he could have very easily gotten to but he chose to be in the swamp, in the tall grass. So you gotta ask yourself, if you were in Corey's position and you had the choice between standing in knee deep water in the middle of a swamp in the tall grass where there are other dangerous predators in the swamp, or you can just stand on a path and be safe, which would you choose? Well, obviously you'd choose the path under normal conditions, but if you were trying to hide from someone, you might choose the tall grass. The last time Jim saw Corey, he was walking into the woods with Sammy carrying his shotgun. But when they found Corey in the marsh, there was no gun. And in fact, that gun was never recovered, but they did find an expended shotgun shell casing basically along the path they think Corey took to get to the marsh. He did have his cell phone on him, but from what I read, it looked like either he didn't use it or he just never had any service. Corey's death was ruled an accident, even though many people believe it's far more likely he was being pursued by someone or something, because it's just not normal human behavior to in the middle of the night, get up and run 14 miles through a swamp. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's video, let us know in the comments what it is. 2014, the United States Navy decided it was time to decommission one of their old frigate ships. And so they sent it to a dock to be broken down for scrap. In order for workers to actually be able to access the underside of the ship and actually begin to break it down, they would need to dry dock the ship, which meant the ship would basically drive into this special locking corral where the doors would shut behind it, the water would drain out from underneath, and the ship would be left resting on these huge wooden blocks that elevated it off the ground. And with no water in there, workers were able to get underneath the hull and could access every part of the ship without obstruction. It's important to note for this story that when a ship is in dry dock, there is only one way on or off. It's this ramp called a gangway that leads from the dock 
onto the deck of the ship. Besides that, there is nowhere else for you to get on this ship. And if for some reason you really wanted to get on and couldn't use the gangway, you could in theory try to run and leap from the dock to the ship. There's a pretty significant gap there all the way around, but you could try the jump. But if you weren't successful at grabbing onto the ship, you would fall multiple stories, probably to your death, because there's no water in the dry dock. So this old frigate ship that was being decommissioned was officially dry docked in July of 2014. The first group of people that went on board the ship to begin dismantling it were military personnel. They were in charge of removing all of the sensitive equipment before civilians were allowed to go on board. The military personnel begin to wrap up and it's getting late in the day and they tell the foreman who's in charge of all of the civilian workers that are going to be going on and finishing this decommissioning of this ship. They go to the foreman and they say, hey, we're done. We're wrapped up for the night. Your workers are good to go. They can get on here tomorrow. The foreman would send a message to his boss that night, letting him know that they were on track to start work the next day. The boss would respond and say, hey, can you go on there tonight and take pictures of all the different workstations so we know how many people that we need to place in different segments of this big ship. So the foreman walks onto the ship and proceeds to take hundreds of pictures all over the inside of the ship. Now, the ship itself was pitch black inside. There was no electricity and it was nighttime. So he had a flashlight the whole time, but whenever he took a picture, he would turn his flashlight off and then use the flash on his camera before going back to his actual flashlight. So all night he's going room to room taking all these pictures and at some point he realizes he's photographed everything he needs to. So he leaves, he goes back to his office, he uploads the pictures and he sends them to his boss. His boss wrote back almost immediately and just said, who's the guy with the ax? Now the foreman has no idea what he's talking about. He was just in the ship by himself for a couple of hours and didn't see anyone. So he reads the email again to make sure he read it correctly and he sees that his boss is actually attached the picture he is referring to. Here is this guy clearly clutching an ax in a hallway that he was just in. And even creepier is the foreman is looking at where this picture was taken and it was relatively early on in his photo shoot. And he had walked past the exact area where this guy is poking his head out of, which means the whole time he was down there, this guy with an ax was there with him. They review the security footage of a camera that was aimed directly at the ramp, the one entrance in and out of the ship. And from the time the foreman left, no one else left. So they don't know how he got on or how he got off without being detected, but somehow he did. In 2014, Alan Ruby was a 19-year-old freshman studying political science at the University of Oklahoma. Despite being relatively modest and soft-spoken in person on social media, he projected this lifestyle of wealth and grandeur. He'd oftentimes post pictures of exotic sports cars and expensive watches and clothes, and he would travel the world to Paris, London, New York City, and take all these pictures showing off this incredible life he had. He really wanted people to believe that he was this fabulously wealthy Healthy, successful guy. Alan was only able to project this phony lifestyle on social media because he was spending his father's money. His father was a successful businessman who was also the publisher of a newspaper that was quite successful and so Alan would just spend his money and then even after his father would give him money Alan would steal his credit card and additionally rack up thousands of dollars of credit card debt. But as media began to shift away from print media to almost all digital, a lot of newspapers began to fail because they weren't able to transition to digital. And his father's newspaper was not making that transition very well and they were losing money left and right. And so Alan's father told everybody in his family with a focus on Alan that we all need to cut back on our spending because money's tight right now and it's unclear if it's gonna turn around. So we gotta be careful with how much money we do have. Alan acted like he was gonna cut back on his lavish lifestyle, but in reality, he wasn't going to. He was totally addicted to spending money and giving off this vibe that he was so wealthy and successful. And so around this time, Alan steals his grandmother's credit card and secretly leaves the country and goes to Paris to have this vacation on his own. He's taking these pictures in front of the Eiffel Tower and he's spending all this money. And his father finds out that he's stolen this credit card and he's furious. And instead of waiting for Alan to come home and saying, don't do that again, he decides he's gonna send him a message that he's gonna remember. And he calls the police. Alan gets charged with theft. He pleads guilty and he has to go before a judge who sees that he has no criminal record. So he kind of goes easy on him. And he says that you need to pay back all the money you spent to your grandmother 
and you need to go to an addiction program to try to break this habit of yours, to stop spending all this money. After Alan leaves court, his father felt like he finally got the message. It seemed like it had finally gotten through to him that this was a really big problem and he felt like he had made the right decision in calling the police. But in reality, Alan hadn't changed at all. As soon as he got back from court, he was stealing from people outside of the family. He was taking loans from loan sharks, all of this just to keep up with his phony appearance he portrayed on social media. On October 9th, 2014, Alan owed $3,000 to a particular loan shark and had no way of paying it back. So instead of asking his parents for money, which for him would have been too embarrassing, he decides the best course of action is to kill his entire family. And so he strolls into his home and he shoots his mom dead, he shoots his sister dead, and then he waits for his dad to come home and he shoots him dead. Because his big plan is with his whole family gone, he's gonna become the sole heir to the family's estate and that will be enough money to not only pay off this $3,000 debt, but have a little leftover so he can go on vacation to Paris again. So after he's committed this horrible crime, he leaves his family where they are, he goes and takes the surveillance footage from inside the house, it was on a DVD, takes the DVD out, takes the murder weapon, leaves the house, chucks the DVD and the weapon into a lake, and proceeds to drive to Dallas, where he checks into a very fancy hotel and meets up with friends and parties the whole weekend. His friends that were with him that weekend would later tell investigators that Alan seemed totally normal. There was no red flags. There was no indication that anything was wrong. He was just laughing it up and having a great time that whole weekend. The following Monday, when Alan's father doesn't show up for work, the police are notified. They go to the house and they find the Ruby family. When police went out and got Alan and brought him back to the station to chat with him and tell him what happened and see if he knew anything, his sad reaction to his whole family now being deceased was apparently so insincere that officers almost immediately assumed that he was probably the guy that did it. Ultimately, Alan would confess and the prosecutor wanted to push for the death penalty, but Alan's remaining living family members actually said, don't do the death penalty. We don't wanna risk that not happening. We wanna see justice served right now. Can we create a plea agreement where he gets life in jail, but there's absolutely no way for him to get paroled, no matter how good his behavior is, no matter how old he is, no matter what, he can't ever get out of jail. And so they did. They created that plea agreement. They gave it to Alan to sign. He signs it. And as they're walking out of the courtroom, his last remaining family members disown him and say, may God have mercy on your soul. And they leave. This is the picture that Alan uploaded to his Instagram account just hours after killing his entire family. They're all lying on the ground in his house at the time this picture is being taken. He's in this fancy hotel room with his friends and the caption reads, college wouldn't be half as fun without these two peaches. Hashtag best friends. One night in the early 1950s, a little boy named Issei Sagawa was having this dream where he and his brother were being boiled alive to be eaten. Sagawa says when he woke up, he immediately began fantasizing about what it would be like to be on the other side of that, to be on the outside with a human inside of the pot that you're boiling, that you're gonna eat. And he became totally obsessed with the idea of eating another person. By the time he was in first grade, he would find himself staring at his different classmates' legs and his mouth would be watering because he wanted to take a bite out of their leg. For three decades, he was able to suppress that urge, but in 1981, those cannibalistic urges would get the better of him. One summer day while he was in Tokyo, he saw this woman that he wanted to eat and he couldn't help himself. And so he began following her down the road and he saw her go into her apartment. He waited for a minute, went around back and climbed in the window. And when he got inside, she was asleep. And he hadn't thought of a plan for what he was gonna do once he was inside. And so he's just standing there thinking, well, now what do I do? How am I gonna eat her? What am I gonna do next? 
And as he's sitting there wondering what to do next, she wakes up and she screams and he runs away. After this breaking and entering incident, Sagawa would actually seek help. So he goes to a psychiatrist and he says, this is what I did. I snuck into her house because I wanted to eat her. And the psychiatrist would end up telling Sagawa's family that I have to label him a high risk to society because he's not just thinking about doing these things. He's already acting out these fantasies. Now, Sagawa's father was extremely wealthy and powerful. And when he heard this from the psychiatrist, he was like, no, we're not gonna do that. And so using his power and influence, he was able to kind of cover up what the psychiatrist had found and he shipped his son to Paris. Once Sagawa landed in Paris, he enrolled at the Sorbonne University and began studying literature. Despite having sought help for his cannibalistic urges, when he was in Paris, he started having that urge again and he couldn't control it. And instead of going to another therapist or psychiatrist, he begins to look for another victim. Sagawa considered himself short, weak, and ugly. And so he was actually looking for a tall, beautiful Western woman so he could absorb their energy and somehow become a bigger, better version of himself. And so he began looking around Paris for tall, beautiful women that he could potentially eat, but no one seemed like a good fit until he met Renee Hartfelt. Renee was a tall, beautiful 25-year-old Dutch student who was going to school with Sagawa at Sorbonne. In order to get close to her, Sagawa would ask his father if he would give him some money so he could hire Renee to be his personal tutor. His father gives him the money, Sagawa hires Renee, and they strike up this working relationship together. And over time, Sagawa would build trust with Renee, they would become friends, and at some point he asked Renee if she'll actually come over to his apartment, something they had not done yet. And she's sitting in his apartment with her back turned to him. He leaves the room and comes back with a rifle and he tries to fire it, but it jams. And she hasn't heard him do this. And so he's standing there and his weapon's now jammed. He hasn't fired it. And he just puts the weapon away and comes back out and acts like nothing's happened. And he's sitting there wondering, is this a sign that I'm not supposed to do this? But at the end of the night, when she finally left, he decides, you know what, I gotta go through with this. I have to eat her. And so the next night he gets her to come over again. He gets the rifle out when she's sitting with her back to him once again, except this time the rifle fires. Only for an instant, he felt really bad and thought maybe I should call an ambulance. But then he stopped himself and he said, you've waited so long for this. You gotta just go through with it. He immediately tried to take a bite out of her, but it was too difficult and unpalatable. So he calmly leaves his apartment. He goes to the store, he gets a blade. He comes back and he's able to begin removing pieces of Renee so he can eat them. Over the next two days, Sagawa would eat most of Renee and he would take pictures of himself throughout the entire experience. When he finally felt full, he left a couple pieces still in his freezer, but put the rest of her in a suitcase and went to dump her in a lake. But as he was wheeling these heavy suitcases around town, people saw them and it just drew a lot of suspicion. And at some point, someone must have called the police. They show up, they ask him what's inside the suitcase, they open it up and there's Renee. When questioned about it, he just said, I killed her to eat her flesh. Sagawa awaited trial for two years in a French prison. And when he finally went in front of a French judge, when the judge read the details of this crime, it seemed so crazy and outrageous that the judge decided there's no way Sagawa can be sane. And so he was deemed insane and unfit to stand trial. He was ordered to go to a mental institution where he would be held indefinitely. Shortly after that, the French deported Sagawa back to Japan where they expected him to remain in a mental institution for the rest of his life. But that didn't happen because the French dropped his case and his documents were sealed. And when he arrived in Japan, the Japanese could not get access to his court documents. And so they did not have a case against Sagawa. And so they had to let him walk free. And so in 1986, Sagawa checked himself out of the Japanese mental institution that he had been sent to, and he's been free ever since. This is a picture of what police discovered when they opened up Sagawa's fridge inside of his apartment in Paris. This is a picture of his kitchen inside of that apartment where you can clearly see plates and different utensils that were all used to eat Renee. This is a picture of the suitcase that Sagawa was lugging around that police showed up and asked him to open and found Renee inside of. And this is Sagawa today walking freely in Tokyo, even though he blatantly killed and ate someone and openly admits to it and has even profited off of it. He's written books and he's been featured on TV shows. He's even been called in to be a food critic. But what's even more horrifying is that Sagawa openly says that before he dies, he's going to do this again. He can't live with himself unless he eats at least one more person. So that's gonna do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed